In the case of Commonwealth versus Carroll, the issue on appeal is whether there was sufficient evidence of first-degree murder. There was obviously plenty of evidence that Carroll had murdered his wife. He shot her twice in the head at close range. What is this murder in the first degree? The common law of England drew no such distinction. Within the category of unlawful homicides, there was simply murder and manslaughter. There was no division of degrees within the category of murder. This came in later and on our side of the Atlantic. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania enacted a statute in 1794 dividing the category of murder into two degrees. The statute inspired many other states of the United States to copy it. The statute of 1794 reads, All murder, which shall be perpetrated by means of poison or by lying in wait, or by any other kind of willful, deliberate, and premeditated killing, or which shall be committed in the perpetration or attempt to perpetrate any arson, rape, robbery, or burglary, shall be deemed murder in the first degree, and all other kinds of murder shall be deemed murder in the second degree. Let's try to break this down. A murder can become a murder in the first degree in either of three ways. A murder committed by means of poisoning or lying in wait counts as murder in the first degree. The Pennsylvania lawmakers evidently thought this kind of killing was especially unsettling. Who knows if someone is putting something into our food or is about to ambush us from the bushes. The third way of counting as a first degree murder, we'll come back to the second way in a moment, is by being connected with any of four enumerated felonies, arson, rape, robbery, and burglary. This is akin to the so-called felony murder rule, which we'll get to later. The second way of elevating murder to murder in the first degree is by a showing that the perpetrator premeditatedly killed with malice aforethought. Malice aforethought marks the line between murder and manslaughter, but add in premeditation and you get murder in the first degree. All other kinds of murder shall be deemed murder in the second degree. In short, under the Pennsylvania statute, there are three ways by which a murderer can be convicted and sentenced for murder in the first degree. By proof that the accused killed by means of poison or surprise, by proof of premeditation, or thirdly, by proof that the accused killed in the course of committing or attempting rape, robbery, arson, or burglary. Why bother dividing the two degrees? Pennsylvania evidently wanted to reserve capital punishment for murder in the first degree. Why? Consider again the case of Gray, the master blacksmith. Suppose another apprentice witnessed what Gray did. If Gray desires only to escape hanging, what might he do? He would be tempted to kill the witness. But if Gray has not committed a hanging offense, he might spare the witness, and the Pennsylvania statute offers him an incentive to stop. Gray did not premeditate, so he should not hang. If he kills the witness and is caught, a jury could find premeditation, and he would hang for that killing. Of course, for the legislative scheme to work, there has to be more to premeditation than malice aforethought, malice aforethought being the culpability that defines murder. Is there more to premeditation? The Pennsylvania legislature evidently meant there to be, but the case law leads us into doubt. The court in Carroll held that there was sufficient evidence to convict the defendant of premeditated murder. The court explicitly rejected the idea that proof of premeditation requires proof of an interval of time between the defendant forming an intention to kill and the act of killing. 
No time is too short, even for a good man. Evidence of premeditation under Carroll need not go beyond evidence of malice of forethought. Over in West Virginia, the court saw the matter differently. Consider State versus Guthrie. Guthrie suffered from a condition known medically as body dysmorphic disorder. He was morbidly obsessed with the size and appearance of his nose. One day, a co-worker engaging in horseplay popped Guthrie on the nose with the flick of a dish towel. Guthrie lost it and fatally stabbed his co-worker. Surely Guthrie is convictable of murder. A jury could find that Guthrie intended to cause serious bodily harm. But murder in the first degree? The issue turns on the jury instructions. On the critical question of premeditation, the jury was told... It is not necessary that the intention to kill should exist for any particular length of time prior to the actual killing. It is only necessary that such intention should have come into existence for the first time at the time. What is meant by the language willful, deliberate, and premeditated is that the killing be intentional. The Guthrie Court held that these instructions, given over objection, constituted reversible error. The instructions might lead the jury to confuse intent to harm, which would suffice to establish malice of forethought, with premeditation. A spontaneous and unreflective killing would be no more than murder in the second degree, even if intentional. Not all spontaneous and unreflective killings are pretty. The facts of Anderson versus California are sufficiently heinous, I won't repeat them. The court in Anderson tried to inject some rigor into the concept of premeditation by distinguishing three kinds of evidence, planning, motive, and manner. A supportable first-degree murder conviction, the court wrote, required at least strong evidence of planning or evidence of motive in conjunction with either planning or method. Sifting the record, the Anderson court found that the defendant had no plan, had no evident motive, and that the sloppy and ghastly manner in which the victim was assaulted did not bespeak a purpose to end the victim's life. The conviction of murder in the first degree was set aside. The defendant was sentenced for murder in the second degree. Back in West Virginia, Guthrie was retried by a jury given an Anderson-style instruction and was again convicted of murder in the first degree. Which was the worst killing, Anderson or Guthrie? Anderson or Carroll? A majority of states reject Anderson and even the Guthrie requirement that there be some evidence of a preconceived design. The effort to use premeditation as the mark of the worst murders appears to have gone awry. Is there a way to repair the doctrine of murder in the first degree? We will pursue an answer in the next video.